Hi everybody, welcome back to 10% True. My next guest is Lieutenant Colonel Retired John Huggy Huggins. Huggy is the all-time high hours U2 pilot and has flown the spy plane over the course of four decades, starting in the 1990s. He's also the only guest I've had who's thought about continuity between interviews and made sure he turned up to follow-on interviews wearing the same shirt. I'm not sure which accomplishment is greatest, but I do know that it confirms what I've previously been told about him, that he's a man of great character. Speaking of continuity, you may notice that in the first two interviews he talks about being retired and no longer in the U2 programme. Off camera he had told me that he might be going back in, but that decision hadn't been made and it wasn't made until after our second interview. So, for the avoidance of doubt, he's back in the programme and flying the U2 again, but this time as a civilian instructor. This is the first of a three-part interview, and as usual, before you delve in, I'd like to ask you to hit that bell notification icon in YouTube. If you think the podcast is good, if you enjoy it, I'd also encourage you, please, share it with your friends and family. Enjoy. Huggy, thanks for joining us on 10% True. It's good to be here on 10% Truth. So, so you're our, our first... That's the, 100%, that's the 100% Truth, actually, right there. It's good Thank to you. be here. Thank you very much. So, so that's, uh, you're, you're our first and, and maybe the only U2 pilot that I'll interview on the channel. Um, and we'll get to talking about the U2 uh, shortly. But where I like to start with all my guests is by finding out a little bit about them and why it is that they became um, a pilot in the first place, why they joined the Air Force. And perhaps you could tell us your story. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Uh, born in Arizona, but I'm a Texan. When we were very young, my, my parents here were both Texans. My dad, uh, in 1967, picked up and took a job with uh, a company uh, working uh, right across the street from the fairly new Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. So my dad uh, moved into the Apollo program in 1967 as an engineer. And I grew up from 67 until uh, off, off to college. Uh, moved around a little bit, but always came back. But I grew up right on the right on the gate, if you will, of NASA there uh, in the space program in Houston. And um, you know, growing up, you know, you, you look back on it, and the kids I grew up with, uh, kindergarten, you know, kindergarten, um, Neil Armstrong's son was in my class, and you go through elementary school, and all the kids, you know, it's like, hey, what does your dad do? He's an engineer. What does your dad do? Oh, he went to the moon. Yeah, great. Let's go play kickball. You know, nobody cares when you're five, six, seven, eight years old. Hey, yeah, your dad's an astronaut. That's great. You know, let's go. You know. Um, so grew up with a lot of these kids. I, I have to think that a lot of a lot of the influence uh, just came from being around so much aviation in the community. Uh, everything was space program. I went to Edward H. White Elementary. You know, he's one of the one of the astronauts that died on on the Apollo One. Grew up just underneath the pattern at Ellington Field, which back in the day they had the NASA T-38s, and they had I mean back then they had probably had F-101s. Uh, I think we were, the, we were the last unit to fly the F-101 in the United States. Uh, so a lot of aviation around there, but um, moving around, well, we moved around for a few years and came back uh, when I was 16. And at that point, I'm starting to look at what I want to do for, uh, you know, going into college. And uh, deep down, I, I just had this, I'd never had worked at the airport. A lot of people out there washing airplanes and doing what they can to get rides. I'd never even flown in a, in a small airplane uh, at that point. But I just had this feeling that says what I want to do. And uh, you could, if you go back 40 years and look at what the influences were, you could probably dial it up a little closer, but just being around so much aviation and I just really felt that that was what I wanted to go do. And I, um, I applied for, uh, I started looking into how to get through college with a scholarship from the United States Air Force or the United States Navy or the Marine Corps. And, and kind of started making my path that direction and um, applied for the scholarship and uh, off to, I got it, I got actually off to university, uh, I went. Yeah, in the what they call the ROTC program, the Air Force ROTC program. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, in high school, I actually uh, applied. This is 19, so I graduated high school in 81. I was born in 63, so at about 1980 time frame, I began to apply for this and had to go through the medical process for the ROTC scholarship, in which they pay a significant portion of your college expenses. And uh, I was actually leaning, uh, back at the time, I was leaning towards uh, the Navy. And the uh, went through the uh, went through the the, uh, the program and the uh, the navy you know the navy signed off on my physical with the exception of my uh, my sight I didn't pass something on the the refractiveness of my eyes and they they made me uh, uh, they would not pilot pilot qualify me uh, as a can as a potential candidate but they would make they would allow me to be uh, qual uh, qualified as an uh, NFO backseater a Rio and 
shortly thereafter, I got a letter from the Air Force that said, yeah, we'll give you the scholarship with the potential you can go to be a, be a pilot. I'm like, well, there we go. I'm taking that path. So uh, off to college, I went University of Texas in Austin and then uh, four years uh, studying computer science and uh, working towards uh, more towards my commission as a second lieutenant in the uh, United States Air Force. And, uh, you know, college, college was good, but uh, I really longed to get through the four years to get myself onto the path. And by this point, I'm very, very focused on where I want to be. I want to be out in four years. I want to be commissioned and I want to get that pilot slot. And so I, uh, I worked, worked like everybody else, everybody else does. And, uh, 1983. So two years into college is when they normally award the, Hey, you're going to continue on towards a pilot training vector. You get a pilot slot. And I did. And I began to, uh, I went, I got 13 hours of flying time at the, at the, uh, taxpayer's expense at the airport flying a Cherokee 140. Got, got through my initial solo and, and, uh, that was it until I finished college and, uh, and was off to pilot training. So as far as where I came from uh, and how I, how I really got there and, you know, what, there was not one specific thing I can, I can tell you that was, this was the, the epiphany I had that I wanted to be a pilot, but uh, it just, it just, it just slowly built and morphed. And by, I think by the time I was 16, it, uh, um, it became, uh, it became something I really wanted to go do. And what's, what's, what's a, a kind of a neat, a little side story I'll, I'll tell you is uh, I went to, I said, I went to Clear Lake High School, the Falcons there. Uh, just outside uh, outside of NASA, and the house we lived in, we had it for the last you know thirty years. We just sold the house about seven years ago. Uh, you can stand on the roof of my house now because it's housed behind. But you can see the Saturn V rocket laying at NASA. You know, it just it's I mean, it's it's maybe a mile away as the crow flies. Uh, it's now encased in a building. Now they've really realized it's a historic relic, and they've uh, they've finally got it under the protection it needs. But I mean, it literally was on the back gate uh, of NASA. Um, but uh, when I was going for my scholarship, my favorite English teacher uh, in high school um, was uh, June Scobie. And she was my favorite, favorite teacher, senior year. And I asked her if she would write me a letter of recommendation. And uh, she said she would. And uh, she, has, she had a son, Rich, who's a year younger than me. And her husband, uh, Dick Scobie, was the commander of the, of the Challenger when it, uh, when it, when it went during the mishap. But uh, that was five years later. This is 1981, five years before the Challenger mishap. And every year before graduation, she would invite the senior class over to her house for, you know, one evening and, you know, cookies and, you know, socializing and, you know, great job, that kind of thing. And so we're, this is, you know, a few months right before I graduated high school and we went over to the house and she grabbed her husband. Oh, Dick, this is John Huggins. He wants to go into the United States Air Force. Would you, would you talk to him? And so Colonel Scobie pulled me aside and walked me through the house for 10 or 15 minutes and showed me his pictures. And of course, you know, I'm, you know, 17, 18 years old and just kind of blown away. Here's this astronaut talking to me one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, you know, that was a very, very, uh, that, that was a very, very, um, um, uh, important moment to me is spending time with him and he's showing me all his test pilot school plaques and talking to me about, you, you know, us air force and Navy. And again, that also helps cement my direction going towards the United States air force after talking to him and, uh, and him talking that up. Um, and then, um, oddly enough, rich, uh, who's a year younger than me, Rich is now four-star general. He's the uh, he's the head of the Air Force Reserve Command. He'd flown F-16s. I ended up going to his change of command years ago when he took an F-16 squadron at Luke uh, when he was uh, when he was lieutenant yeah, when he was lieutenant colonel. Uh, but it's just kind of uh, again, you know, we were you know we we're high school. We didn't really know, know each other that well in high school. We were a year apart. But his mom was my favorite English teacher. And actually, when I went out for his change of command uh, out in Arizona, I got to. Uh, I got to see her again, have having had you know, 20, 20, 25 years later, whatever it was. So a little, little, a little segue, a little side story on, on how that came about. How, how did you find the reality of, of flying then? So those, those 13 hours, so, cause lots of people have this um, romantic um, sort of attachment to flying and some people fly and realize actually it's not for them. Uh, it's, yeah. it, you know, they like the idea of it. They'll do flight sims and make model aircraft and read the books and the magazines and they're interested in it, but they don't really want to actually fly once they've experienced it. So how were those first 13 hours for you? Uh, really enjoyable. Uh, probably a little, a little more difficult than I thought it would be. Uh, in, some, in some respects, I, I went in with my preconceived notion. I, I know exactly how I'm going to get this done. Here's how you do it. And had to listen to the instructor and my, uh, my preconceived notions weren't necessarily the, the right way to go about flying, but um, I loved every minute of it. I, I did find it to be a, a discipline, something I wanted to study and be focused on the whole time. And uh, my mind will tend to wander, but if it's something that is something I, if it's something I'm really interested in, uh, I can really focus on it. And this was one of the areas that uh, uh, it, it met all the expectations, put it that way. And uh, I'll never forget my, uh, my initial solo at a, 
small airport called Tim's Air Park. It's, it's, a, it's gone now in Austin, Texas. But we were flying. The instructor got out of the aircraft and said, take it around the pattern three times. And I just remember, you know, on the initial takeoff, you know, rolling down the runway by myself, lifting off and, you know, turning and turning left, just, just looking out the window and just screaming at the top of my voice, you know, as I'm turning left, uh, you know, left crosswind out there. Uh, what, what a great feeling it was. So uh, it was it was it was 13 hours. I really should have stayed with it for even more and, and got my full private. But uh, I saved the money and, and focused on just getting through college in two years. But it was it was uh, w- once I did it, I, I knew that was the path I wanted to go. You said that you studied computer science as well so so was that i mean you know some people some people who are young and approaching you know decision making age around what they want to do fret about what they study um did did your choice of of subject impact your career later on was it material to what you ended up doing as a as a pilot as a u2 pilot no i I, just more the discipline the reason i got into computer science more than likely was my brother who's nine years older than me he's uh he's a computer computer uh, kind of early computer guy and my dad really wanted us to go. I really wanted us to get to into in, you know working together at some point in a company, and he was really pushing me towards computer science. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, I got going into computer science. And uh, after my first year, I was able to get a a co op job with uh, with IBM, right across the street from NASA. So I would come home for summer, come home for even Christmas break. I, uh, IBM was very good to me, and they would let me go in. And I was doing programming. I was working on the space shuttle, uh, on the space shuttle program. And uh, it was it was a really really unique uh, program to be in for somebody you know you know basically 19 20 years old tw- up through 21 uh, to work on and I, I did I, I think I did pretty good work and it gave me a practical real world look and I, I think it probably helped motivate me when you're doing all the academia computer science and then going to IBM and here we are working on the space shuttle program and doing that um, and at the end of in 1985 right before I graduated IBM actually gave me a fantastic job offer they were just starting their space station group which was about 14, 15, 16 people that they took from inside the company. And they were bringing, they hired one college uh, uh, graduate, one new, one new hire to come into space station. And uh, I got the job offer, but I had my, you know, at that point it was like, I, I, I can take the path to IBM or I can take the path of the air force. And that was a no brainer to me. And I said, thank you very much. I've still got the letters somewhere, but I took the path and obviously went to pilot training a couple of months later. What were you coding on, on the space shuttle? Anything interesting? It was I, I was taking care of a database for it. No, nothing that I wrote went on the space shuttle, okay. uh, but I was working in the space shuttle branch with the, with the programmers that were doing all the coding, and uh, they gave me some projects to uh, basically. I, I, wrote, I wrote a bunch of programs to manage and take care of all the discrepancies they were finding with the code. So, so you get through ROTC, and what happens next? You go straight to pilot training. You know, I was uh, so as as we we're coming up on graduation, I've got a set of um, I got a um, I, not orders actually, but I was told, hey, you're uh, I was going to graduate in May of '85, and probably in the January time frame, I guess somewhere in there, I was told I was going to go to Columbus Air Force Base for uh, pilot training in um, I think it was November, uh, or it was maybe nine months, maybe January the following year. I you know I didn't want to get commissioned in May, and I, was, I figured I'd just go back to IBM and work with them. For the six and you know seven eight nine months whatever it was, and <laughs> being one to never take no for an answer, I, uh, I I got a hold of the Air Force Personnel Center and I said, hey, I'd like to get on a would they have a thing called at the time called the Moments Notice List? I'd like to get on the Moments Notice List. You know, if somebody you know breaks a leg on you know a week before pilot training, they can run through the list. Hey, who can fill the slot short notice? And I got my name on the list and waited. And then uh, about a about April time frame, you know, graduate getting commissioned mid May. Sometime in April, I got called into the RTC office to say, "Hey, they've got a pilot training slot for you." Uh, June, you have to, it's a report date of uh, June third. Start training on June fourth. Two weeks after, two and a half weeks after you got commissioned, can you make it? I'm like, you bet I can. I, you bet I can. Where is it? Del Rio, Texas. Well, from Austin, which is where I was going to school, is 240 miles. So I can be there. In, you know, I can be there in three and a half, four hours. So I uh, graduated, went back to Houston, actually packed up all my stuff. I, everything I owned, I put in my Toyota and uh, in my Toyota hatchback and uh, drove it to Del Rio, Texas. On, arrived on June 3rd of 1985, and, and that, was where, that was where the story began. Did you, um, was there some spin-up time that you, you missed as a result of, of going there at no notice like that then? I mean, had other people already been there and sort of getting to know each other and getting their heads into the books? No, no. At the time, it, it, that was not the case. Everybody uh, now they have they have a lot of pilots that will show up uh, 
a year out, six months out, and they and they stashed them away doing ground duties or whatever. That was not really the case when uh, when I went through in eighty five. That, that that was something that's happened more in the the more modern years, if you will. So when we all showed up. Most of us only been there for a few days. I think some of the folks that were married and had kids uh, that were a little older had showed up a few days early and were getting moved into base housing. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was pretty much all of us showing up on June third, looking around. Okay, here we are. What next? You flew the T thirty seven in, in pilot training. I did. I did fly the T thirty seven. So it's sort of uh, a funny aeroplane to look at, isn't it? But apparently, it has the highest G onset rate of. That's what they say. You know, there's no hydraulic flight control. That's you know, it's fly by wire. It's fly by piano wire. You know, it's direct direct linkage to the uh, to the flight to the main to the primary flight controls. And uh, we actually had a guy in my in my pilot training class was out doing aerobatics with his instructor uh, in T thirty sevens. And uh, they were doing something. He he pulled into something really quick, and the and the instructor wasn't expecting. He put his instructor to sleep, so he said he kind of flew around for a little bit while his instructor was doing the funky chicken, trying to wake him up. And uh, said so he over there, kind of snickering about it. But yeah, put his instructor to sleep. So it, it'll it'll uh, it'll g up pretty well. And what's uh, I don't want to tear off into this. We can talk about this another time if you'd like to. But uh, the A thirty seven, the super tweet, if you will, it's got J eighty fives. It's a monster. There's there are now, there's a, two of them flying in the United States, only one B model with a second B model coming up. And I'm starting to fly that aircraft as a, uh, on the side of the warbird. I've got about six, seven flights in the B model and uh, hopefully get rated in the aircraft here before uh, the end of August. And uh, it's so, uh, you know, after, you know, the last time I flew the tweet, I actually got, I got a flight with a friend back in 94. So, but 25, 20, you know, 25 years and I jump in a super tweet and, and I'm telling you with it, with 5,800 pounds of thrust, it is a different animal. It is a beast, but you know it's still it's still uh, it it will still uh, it'll it'll turn uh, right up itself and it'll 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 load up the G's pretty quickly too. Was it fast? So so you'd done those thirteen hours in a little sort of piston engine propeller aircraft, and mm-hmm. you're now flying a, a twin jet. Um, what was the? Can you compare the two? Yeah, night and day. I thought the uh, in, in many ways the the jet is a lot a lot easier. You get the you get the response when you want, and everybody thinks of the T thirty seven as being a pretty low performance jet, but it, it isn't. You know, it's a twin engine. It's a twin engine jet, and uh, you know it'll 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 easily do two hundred knots. Uh, I don't recall being overwhelmed by it uh, because it was it, it you know it just it just it just was what it was. You jumped in and he went with the instructor, and hair is hair is on fire, and I'm behind and trying to catch up, and I really didn't compare it back to the. I've, I've actually, that's a good question. I've never really thought about how I compared it back to the flying I'd done two years earlier in, in the Cherokee 140. But, uh, you know, you, you just take the skill sets and you, and you learn from there. I, I, did, I guess I didn't, I didn't have the big cerebral analysis I probably should have. I was just, you know, focused on, on just trying to get through the program and, you know, get my wings a year later. They, they say that about UPC, don't they? It's, it's sort of like drinking through a fire hose. So I guess there isn't much time for comp- contemplation. And, uh, yeah, and it's probably not too much. It's just, just, and it's funny to go back to listen to people say it was the worst time of my life and the stress. And I do remember the stress, but, and you know, I probably, it's like everything you, you, you forget 90% of the bad stuff. You remember all the good stuff. And I, I look back on U, UPT as just a wonderful time. You know, we, uh, we all are, you know, a bunch of us, we Friday, we, we just rage all night at the officers club and just have a grand old time. And then we Saturday morning, we'd get up and we'd jump in the cars and we'd just take a four or five ship of cars to San Antonio. And we'd, we just party our way through San Antonio all weekend and we tear back on Sunday night. And, you know, we had a great time. It was, you know, you're 22, 23 years old and you're, you're just, in, you're just on top of the world. I know that you're not, you're not in the air force anymore, but um, so, so you may not feel sort of qualified to, to comment, but I'm curious to know whether or not you've, when, when you were leaving the air force, let's say, um, and whatever exposure you had to UPT at that time, whether the, the culture has changed, whether or not it's different. Um, are students more academic now? Um, does that culture of, um, you know, sort of going out and having fun, does that still exist? Yeah, it definitely does. It's, it's changed quite a bit. The officers club scene is, uh, has pretty much, a lot of it's died. Uh, so they, and they do it in a different way. Yeah, you know, technology is different. The interests are different 35 years later, but, uh, but you know the, the the folks I ran across right before I retired in 2014 that were coming into the U2 and the folks I'd meet on the road, you know it's just, it's the same good people. They're just uh, they're raised in a different time, so a different different level of interest, but they uh, they still have the same passion. Did you struggle with anything then uh, in UPT? Was there anything that really sort of pushed you? Uh, 
You know, I uh, I did really. I thought I did really, really well through tweets. Um, it passed on my check rides. Got through the T thirty eight and was doing really, really well. And uh, I made a single, uh, really silly mistake on my on my first check ride in the T thirty eight and busted the check ride. Had to repeat it. No big deal. Got it. Got it. Got it under control. Um, and then uh, on my formation check ride, um, got back and the instructor busted me for uh, passed everything, but he said yeah, overall airmanship. I guess he said it was too rough on the flight controls. And he didn't like it one bit. So I uh, ended up having to go. So I'm here. I got two busts now in the T38 on, uh, on, um, out of your three check rides. And three, if you have three, you're, you're looking at getting close to being eliminated. But uh, two, uh, two busts, uh, both of them are single item busts. And uh, so that, that really, that really uh, put, the, put the heat on. I really wasn't sure what was going to happen. I was, uh, I, was getting, I was hoping to get fighter qualified. And even with two busts, I, well, with two busts, I figured there was not a chance I was going to get fighter qualified. Just on paper, you look at that and go, "There's no way." Those are the only two busts, the only two rides in the entire UPT program that I that I, that I busted. And um, when it came time to get fighter qualified, uh, my flight commander, who was an F four guy, uh, later F sixteen guy, went to bat for me, and uh, I got fighter qualified. And uh, did well, finished up to the program, did well on my on my nav check. Came up on the assignment night, and uh, have you ever been to a, a, an Air Force assignment night? I've seen it, but I've never been. Yeah. yeah, it's changed a lot over the years, but but back then I think it was a little bit, probably a little bit more drinking and partying in, in the in the environment than there probably there is now. But uh, on ours, uh, we were sitting out in the audience, and uh, they had the, they had a board up there. They looked like a Jeopardy board, if you will, if you, you know the, the show Jeopardy with the squares. Each of the squares was a wooden plaque, and there's F fifteen, C one forty one, C seven. There's all these. This is an array of plaques up there, 40, 50, 60 plaques, whatever it was, and and uh, more than there were the number of the the forty two of us that graduated in my class. And uh, it was called pick your assignment. So they would call your name up there, and you'd walk up there, and you you and each of the uh, each of the is a wooden like a wooden plaque. You you try to pull it, and whichever one came out was the one that was yours. And they had somebody you know behind there, you know, unscrewing them, you know, to you know make sure the right person. So I go up there and. Yeah, I pulled on the pulled on the F four, pulled on the F fifteen, pulled on the F sixteen, pulled on the A ten. I was flabbergasted because there was no way, there was no way they were going to bring me back as an instructor pilot. I I had a few run ins um, while I was there with uh, with folks uh, with instructors, and I was convinced there was there is no chance that they're that they're, there's just no way I'm not coming back. I, I couldn't find my assignment. I, I finally. I finally, I'm behind the board with somebody pushing. You, you saw the you saw you saw the little plaque go slide out about three inches. I'm like, pulled it out. T38. What? You know, and it just I, I was stunned. I didn't know what to, I didn't. And then they 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 come running up and you know the, from the squad and they throw the scarf around your neck and you know the squad commander pats you on the back and you know off off to your chair you go. I just remember sitting there looking at my T38 going, how did this happen? I'm coming back as a T38 instructor. And uh, it was it was a bit shocking at the time, but I, but I will say in retrospect, it was a uh, you I, for somebody like me, it could not have worked out any better uh, for uh, for getting me to to be a, become a more mature aviator, a better aviator, to do things. Uh, uh, it just it just worked out best for me, and then getting me into the YouTube program. I think I would have absolutely loved being in the fighter world. Uh, I don't know that I would have made a twenty eight career a year career out of it based on what I know now of flying fighters and such. Maybe I would have, I don't know, but I do know that if I had to go do it all over again, I don't think I would have changed a thing. I loved my time as a 38 instructor, despite a few things there. And it got me, it got me into the YouTube program, which had the 38s. And uh, I just, I loved every minute about being in the, in the U2. And what got me there really was that first four years, a year of pilot training, and then the, the three years as a T38 instructor. Can we can we talk a little bit about that maturity thing then, and the, the reference to the run-ins with a, a couple of individuals yeah. on the squadron? Uh, you know, probably soaked up a little too much of the environment there, and uh, you know, w- you know, the work hard, play hard, and probably played uh, played entirely too hard in front of too many of the wrong people at times. Um, and uh, but I, I put out good results uh, th- throughout most pilot training, with the exception of those two check rides. Uh, but you know, once I, I just think once uh, you know, showing up as an instructor and you know, I remember the first time I, I did get in the back, uh, right at getting out of the instructor school and coming back there as a brand new guy. And you know, they put me with a pretty good student. They, they put you with good students early on. But that first time jumping back in the back seat with a, with a, you know, you're 23 and you're jumping back there with a 22 year old guy with 20 hours in the airplane. And you're, and you're, you know, you're taking the supersonic jet around uh, South Texas. 
well, you know, the, the responsibility kind of hit me and went, yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is, this is, this is pretty important stuff. And there's a reason that there's a reason I'm working hard at it, but you, you get, you better stay focused 110%, hundred percent of the time or, or it's going to, uh, it's going to, it's going to bite you. So there was, there was definitely, definitely a lot of maturity, a lot of growing during that three years as a T30 instructor, a lot of responsibility. And to this day, uh, people bad mouth fapes and I love, Bad mouthing fapes too. I was a fape, and we're, it's a lot of fun. You know, fapes were all hand picked, hand picked like a booger. And I, I, we love, I love busting on fapes. I was once, um, but they, they really do a, and, and, and even people that get out and don't like, didn't like flying with fapes, and they didn't really know that much, and they, they don't have the big picture. Fine, but they really do yeoman's work, and they, they, uh, uh, they make. Back then, they really made pilot training work. Uh, they work well. They were the worker bees that made pilot training work. I thought that if you were a fate, that was sort of a golden ticket to then go on and do whatever you wanted to do. So if you were a fape and you wanted fighters, how did you end up in the YouTube program? So back in the, uh, so, you know, fate from 86 through 89 was the plan. And uh, you're right, for the most part, especially on the T-38 side, the T-37 guys also did, and gals got a lot of fighters too. Actually, back then they weren't giving fighters to the women. That happened shortly thereafter. But uh, uh, very high percentage of fighters. But if you go back to the, uh, the time frame, about 1987, 88, the Air Force was looking. They're trying to go to 40 fighter wings. If you remember, there was a place in Crotone, Italy, on the, on the Mediterranean side. They were going to build this massive, massive base in Crotone, Italy. And I think they were going to put four or six F-16 squadrons down there on the southern flank. So the Air Force is pumping them up, pumping them up, pumping them up. And about, I don't know, when was that, 19, mid-1988 time frame? The eight, maybe maybe later in the in the time frame, uh, August September, the Air Force decided the forty fighter wing concept isn't happening, and they're closing fighter squadrons. And we start going, you know, we're ramping up, ramping up, ramping up, and then all of a sudden, they're 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 they don't need fighter pilots. That's the last thing the Air Force needs. And we all saw the writing on the wall, and we saw a couple assignment drops where instructors, you know, the, you know, we'd have six instructors get an assignment, and maybe one would get a fighter. The top guy would get a fighter. So the writing was on the wall. Um, <laughs> Even at the time, I was, uh, uh, although my maturity had definitely improved, the current squadron commander there was, uh, was certainly not uh, a fan of John Huggins. So uh, I, I knew that the uh, proverbial hauling rubber dog shit out of Hong Kong was coming my direction. So I, uh, um, I basically started to look around and find another, uh, another path. And as a uh, guy who was flying T-37s, John Roush, I'd, I'd met him through the, uh, on the periphery. And uh, John said, hey, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm applying to the U-2 program. And I asked John the same question that people ask about the U-2 program now. They're still flying that airplane? And this is, you know, 1988, 89, uh, probably late 88. And John said, yeah, I'm going to go out and apply for it. And uh, let me show you my application. So he went, you know, a couple days later, got in the application, showed it to me. And I started, you know, again, there's no internet back then. You know, you can't just get on there and Google YouTube program and find all this out. So I found out about it from John. And uh, he went out and did the interview and he got hired. And so I started, he gave me the phone number. I called the recruiters there and said, I, you know, I'd like to find out a little bit more about this. A few weeks later, uh, just coincidentally, a couple of YouTube pilots came through Laughlin to give their uh, recruiting brief that they still go travel around and give. And I went and sat through it. There were a couple of grizzled old uh, guys. One of the guys was a Passover major, and the other guy was a lieutenant colonel, former squadron commander. And they were just telling stories about flying in Vietnam and flying to the U-2. And uh, we, I, was just, I, was, I was like, this, is, this sounds like a great group of people and a great mission and a cool airplane. I mean, in Northern California and England, you got to be kidding me. This is, this is great. So uh, I put all my eggs, you know, I, I'm all in. I applied for the program. And uh, in early 1989, I got, the, uh, I got the call from a guy named Bill Gilbert, one of the pilots out there, and said, you've been accepted for an interview. And I, I had, I mean, I had, you had to have 900 hours, and I think I had like 905 hours when I, when I applied to the program. So I was just barely in. Surprised I got the interview, uh, but I got picked up for the interview in, uh, for the interview in early 18, 1989. That's, how, that's where that all went. When you say interview, um... You, do you also mean a, a, a test flight or some description? Because is that not part of the interview process for the U2 community now? Yeah, the interview process has not changed a whole lot compared to uh, uh, even today going back to when I interviewed. So the way it works is they'll, uh, w once you're accepted for the interview, they screen, the, they screen all the applications, pick the people they want, and they, uh, they offer you the invite. They pay for you to fly out commercial out to Beale Air Force Base. 
and you usually arrive on the weekend. And then uh, Monday, uh, for, for week one, Monday through Friday, um, actually Monday through Thursday, is normally just interviews with the squadron commanders, uh, the ops officers, and then usually one or two of the uh, 06s in the chain of command, the ops group commander. In, in my case, I had to go interview with the wing commander. They don't usually do that now. Uh, but normally, just the leadership, find out you know who you are, what you're there for, and then they give you a lot of time off. And it's a chance for you to interview the pilots of the program. So the, the interview is two ways. They want people that are volunteers. They want to make sure you totally understand what you're getting yourself into. And this is not for everybody. So it's a chance for not only them to interview you, but for you to interview the program. So you can go jump out and uh, ride, with a, with, ride with anybody you want while they're out in the chase car, chasing the U-2 and the mobile, get a chance to watch the landings from the outside because the next week you're going to be in the aircraft. So a great way to kind of do that that vision of what the plane should look like when you're flying the aircraft, what it should look like from the outside. Um, and again, just a lot of free time. And, you know, I've seen it where folks would come out and do a mobile ride and then, you know, they take off for the day. And then, you know, the next day they come rolling in whenever. And yeah, I kind of know how this interview is going to go. Uh, and then uh, they see, but you see most of the folk, near, most of the people go out there, go there and they spend, you know, they'll, they'll be out there for a 12 hour day. And at the end of the day, they'll, they'll pop by the squadron, uh, the squadron bar and they'll, they'll go in and talk to people at the bar and find out more. What, what is life like at the detachments? What are the mission sets like? What, what's the challenges here? Tell me about flying a nine hour mission. How do you, how do you stay awake on a nine hour mission? So there's a lot to learn uh, about, about the U2 mission from the other pilots that are actually doing it. Um, one of the problems is that the, the, pilots that interview tend to group around the pilots that are there as students. Well, the, that's a good group of guys to, and gals to go talk to, but realize they haven't even been on the road yet. So we always try to push them over to the, the guys that have been on the road for a year or two and, and get, get the perspective from them. So um, you do that Monday through Thursday. On Friday uh, morning, you'll sit down with uh, your instructor pilot. You're going to have two instructor pilots, but you have a primary and you'll sit down with them for about a three to, it depends, probably about a three hour briefing, three, three and a half hour briefing, talking about the flying the U-2, the flight characteristics of the U-2. You've already done your egress training. Monday through Thursday, you'll do egress training also in between. You'll do, uh, you'll do a pressure, you'll actually go jump in the space suit for 45 minutes or an hour. They just want you to get in the suit and, and they have you sit in a chair in a closet for 30 minutes, you know, just to see if, you know, you know okay, get in the suit and they lock you in there and on oxygen. Okay, we'll be back in 30 minutes. And you just, Okay, you know, you know, if you remember that scene from the right stuff when they're in the, they're in the in the chamber, but they're, they're not blowing smoke at you and making noise, but they just let you sit there and, you know, say, you know, do I want to do this for nine hours? I don't know. You know, plus two hours getting in, and you know, it's, it's 13, 14 hours wearing that thing, so it's a good chance for you to see if it if it's going to work out well for you. Uh, most people don't have a problem with it; it's fine. It's just a little different. Uh, and then again, going jump, jumping back to Friday, you brief it up. And uh, usually done by lunch on Friday, briefing up the briefing up the flight. But during that three-hour briefing, it's you're going through all the flight characteristics, and then you go through the profile. Hey, we're going to take off. We're going to climb up over the field. We're going to just go to 10,000, 11, 12,000 feet VFR, fly around, give you a feel for the aircraft. Then we'll begin to uh, do some do some turns. We'll play with the spoilers, and we'll do some speed breaks, and we'll do different roll rates. So we'll take them through in detail of what they're going to do. Give them a chance to think about the uh, the sortie over the weekend. And we'll do high speed, low speed. We'll do the stall series with the flaps at all the different configurations, the whole nine yards. And then after about 30 minutes uh, over the field, I, when I did interviews, I spent a, actually a fairly, a fairly long time over the field letting them fly the aircraft a lot because we're going to get a lot of patterns. And we'll come back down into the pattern and uh, start beating up the pattern with a few low approaches, an ILS, and then we'll get into the touch and goes. So you finish that up on Friday. And Friday, you know, you're done. And usually everybody heads to the, the bar on Friday, and it's a good chance to for everybody to get, a, get to see the new interviewee, socialize with them a little bit. And uh, then when you come in on Monday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you get three flights. So on flight one, you're flying with your primary instructor. It's a two and a half hour flight. Again, initially go high and then come back and do your ILS and a bunch of patterns. Flight two, we introduce in engine out patterns and the no flat patterns. And uh, on those two flights, your secondary instructor is driving the chase car and taking all the notes. On flight three, it's a two hour version. It's a shortened version of flight two. Uh, and the two pilots switch. Your primary instructor now is in the chase car, and the backup instructor uh, is in your is in your front seat. And yes, as you in your interview, you actually interview in the back seat of the of the airplane. The visibility is as good, if not better, in the back seat because it's stepped up eighteen inches. Uh, but you don't have the you don't have you don't have throttle cutoff, and there's a lot of a lot of functions in the and that we don't we don't want you to know about uh, worry about. And that's why we just put them in the back seat for the for the interview flights. 
so you do that two hour flight in the uh, on, on flight three with the uh, with the with your backup instructor and it varies. We have a lot of flexibility, but uh, for the most part, the instructor is not going to say much. He's going to treat it more like an evaluation. Uh, I, I would give a little of an, a little instruction, but I shouldn't have to give near as much. And hey, show me, you know, show me your ILS, show me you know, your no flaps, show me your engine out patterns, uh, show me a normal landing, show me a no voice landing. And so we have them take us through the profile for two hours, and then at the end of that, they taxi in, they shut down. We kick them off for a couple hours, go get lunch, and we'll sit down and we'll we'll hash it out and we'll say, what do you think? And uh, it, uh, the way it works is if both pilots come to a consensus and, uh, until, until they both agree on yes or no, they don't really come out of the room until they figure it out. And then if they both say, yep, we want them or no, we don't want them. Then they march over to the squadron commander's office and, uh, squadron commander will say, okay, what do you guys think? Well, we don't, we, you know, we do want to hire them and here's why, and, or we don't want to hire them and here's what we saw. And, uh, squadron commanders have been, you know, they're extremely supportive and uh, they, they, as they should, they all ask a lot of questions and, and um, uh, try to dig into what, you know, some more insight as to what happened on the flights. Many times on the flights, they'll actually come out and drive a few of the, few of the chases out there as a second car, just kind of watching things and keeping oversight. Uh, but assuming they get hired, uh, and right, our hire rate's pretty good. We, we screen pretty well. Uh, we call them into the office, and they walk in the squadron commander's office, and sometimes, uh, depending on the squadron commander, he'll have a little bit of fun with them and make them, make them really sweat it out, but then, uh, you know, tell them that they've uh, – They've been accepted into the program, and uh, usually quite a quite a joyous evening uh, follows after that. So uh, that, that's it ends up being about uh, five days the first uh, week and three days the second week. Um, and in my case, it was uh, it was a little different. I, I I tell you about that one if you'd like. All right. So uh, this is uh, Memorial. It's actually Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, which is right now for in the United States Memorial Day weekend. So I went out to interview a week, uh, two weeks prior to Memorial Day weekend. Got there on Monday, did everything, and uh, briefed up. On Monday, I, uh, I flew my first flight. Uh, and remember, coming out of pointy jet, pointy nose jet like the T-38, where you don't step on the rudder and the flare. And the T-38, if you step on the rudder, it doesn't yaw the aircraft. It'll, if you step on the left rudder, it'll roll the aircraft at the, at the higher angles of attack. In the U-2, if you, if you try to land in a crosswind, if you don't step on the rudder, you're going to go off the runway. You've got to crank the rudder in so it was, and, and get the nose straight. It was very unnatural for me to put, push on the rudder. We didn't have much crosswind on day one. So when I did my, did my flights, probably average. I've watched my tapes. Average is slightly below average. Uh, flight two, we started to get some good crosswind in there, and I was having a little bit of, a, uh, a little bit of difficulty with, with, with the uh, get, wanting to step, you know, smash rudder in there. Uh, again, probably average, uh, maybe slightly improved average, maybe slightly below average. Flight three, they flip-flop to the, the evaluator now. And we take off, and the winds are howling pretty good. We're, we're, we're maxing out near uh, 12, 15 knots across, which is the U2 limit. So come in and do some landings. I'm landing in a crab. I am, I'm all over the place. And um, talking to the instructor later, uh, the evaluator later, he's like, yeah, he was, I was ready just to go ahead and terminate the sortie and, and you know, basically say, you know, thanks for playing and hope you have a great career. Thank you very much. But uh, my, my last cup, I guess I had two landings in a row that looked pretty decent. And... Uh, he, was, he wanted to see a little bit more, and then they said, make it a full stop. Winds are out of limits. So he took the jet. We landed, and the winds were out of limits. So they kicked me off, went off and did their powwow, and they came back, and they said, we're going to incomplete the ride, and we're going to have you refly it tomorrow, Thursday. Okay. You know, he, said, he basically said, hey, look, you look bad at the beginning. Then all of a sudden, your know, learning curve shifted, so I want to see a little bit more. I'm not, right, right ready. I'm not just ready to kick you to the curb yet. So came in on Thursday. Winds are howling. They said, yeah, weather shop, weather shop says we're out of limits all day. Forget it. We'll fly tomorrow. So uh, came in on Friday. Winds are howling. Sat around the squadron drinking coffee all day. Not weather shop says it's not going to happen. We'll see you next week. Well, that was Memorial Day weekend. So we're off Saturday. We're off Sunday. And Monday is a holiday. So Tuesday came in. Now I hadn't flown. You know, the last time I flew was the previous Wednesday. And now here we go six, seven, six days later on the following Tuesday after Memorial Day weekend. Jumped in the jet and we went and flew. And the flight was a, I guess it was good enough because they hired me. And uh, the, uh, I, I've never confirmed it, but they told me that a, after I was hired that the, the last seven pilots that they that they'd interview had not been hired, and that frankly they they need they had to have somebody to put in training for the next class. Uh, the, they their hands were tied. They had they had to bring me on board, but uh, I don't know if that's true or not. But I, I don't care. All I all I knew was I was going to get to uh, get to come back in uh, a few months later and go go into training. So I was pretty happy about that. And in fact, Memorial Day weekend was the, 
it was my it was my first uh, first wedding anniversary too. So I was wanting to get back so I could you know my wife's back in Texas, uh, but I ended up flying her out, uh, which is always a bad omen. You never bring your wife out to a YouTube interview. Uh, it's just you just don't do it. But I brought her out for the anniversary, and, and like I said, it worked. It uh, it worked out, and I got hired. So, so can we break this down a little bit then? Because there, there are there, there's a number of elements I think that, are, that would be good to explore. So the first then, um, and probably the most interesting, is that this is a difficult airplane to land. Mm -hmm. So yeah. can you describe why? Yeah, well, it's a tail dragger, um, and you talk to folks that fly in the civilian world with a lot of tail draggers. You know, they'll say, "Yeah, it's a, a tail dragger is a tail dragger," but and and uh, and they have different levels of difficulty. But we're not flying with folks that came out of civilian world. We're, we're flying with folks that came out of mil spec aircraft, you know, B twos, F fifteens, F sixteens. These aircraft, all these pilots will tell you when they fly them, these are, these are pretty easy aircraft to fly. They are not easy to employ, and there's a it takes a lot of skills to be able to employ those aircraft. But from a stick and rudder standpoint, uh, I, I would I bet they tell you for the most part. I'm sure they have their intricate, you know, their their uh, uh, the things that make them very very difficult idiosyncrasies. But uh, for the most part, they've all told me they're pretty simple jets to fly. Uh, the U-2, from a stick and rudder standpoint, not an easy aircraft to fly. Designed in the 50s, terrible visibility. And there's a, there's a, the test pilots, when they design an aircraft, and I'm not a test pilot, so I'm, you know, if anybody's listening to this, don't hold me to it. It's called the Cooper-Harper scale, Cooper-Harper scale. And the test pilots evaluate an aircraft on it, and they, from a scale of 1 to 9, I don't know if 1 is the good side or 9 is the good side, but anyways. And they evaluate... The handling aircraft, the visibility, the ergonomics, all the characteristics of the aircraft. And uh, my test pilot friends have said that the U-2 always gets a 7, 8, or 9, or a 1, 2, or 3, whatever it is, the failure, in just about every category it tests in. Every single one. It, it's, it's terrible. We would never buy the U-2 again if we were to put it up for bid and have it looked at. They would evaluate it and go, hey, you got to be kidding. This? You guys want to actually buy this? They would, they would never do it. So you've got the tail wheel, which like pushing a, a shopping cart backwards, it wants to spin around the other direction, okay? And then, you know, at least with, uh, with most tail dragger aircraft in the general aviation fleet, you've got two wheels, you know, left, a left wheel and a right wheel. Well, you too, you've, it's, it's a motorcycle with a 104-foot with wingspan. So when you land at the tail wheel, now you're driving the motorcycle or going across with the tightrope, you, know, you know, with your bars, you don't know, fall off the tightrope, and you've got to keep those wings level the whole time. And the crosswind's trying to push the tail out, so then it, it turns the nose, which makes the outer wing go back down to the left side, and all these things begin to compound. And and it's it's it, it when you're coming out of a mil spec, easy to fly aircraft, easy stick and rudder aircraft like a C-17 or an F-16, it's uh, it's a little different. And it goes back to the old it's fly by piano wire aircraft. You're you're moving those flight controls not with hydraulics; they're all moved with your muscle. And it's a it's a lot of physical force. You know, you can um, uh, when we go up at when we go up at altitude when we're doing. 200 knots on the aircraft on the on the first uh, interview flight. We'll uh, we'll accelerate the aircraft to 200, and we'll have them put in rudder inputs. And it's 150 pounds of rudder input to uh, to get to get the rudder all the way in, you know, near full deflection. It's it's a lot of physical effort. And you take somebody around the pattern for two two and a half hours, and uh, they have to land full stall and then pull the yoke back. And the whole time they're going down the runway, the left hands on the throttle, and the right hands on the yoke, and they're trying to do all this going down the runway. Pretty soon you get pretty tired. And the air conditioning, you know, in the summertime. Uh, it's not air, it's not very well very well air conditioned and you you see people get out of the cockpit and they they are they are just a mess uh, they're they're sweaty they're 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 exhausted and the next day they're generally pretty sore so it's a very physical aircraft to fly um, prior to getting the new um, it's probably about two thousand three or four time frame when we got the glass cockpit modification on the U two we also got a single piece windscreen uh, most people don't think about this too much but the um, the previous windscreen was like the F-104 windscreen. It was a three-piece windscreen. And the visibility out of that three-piece windscreen was dramatically worse than it is in the current aircraft. So not only are you having this very, very physical aircraft uh, that you're trying to fly and, and fly well, you can't see that side of it. A lot of the, again, a lot of that has changed with the, with the, uh, the single-piece windscreen. It's so much easier. But the, the old, the old three-piece windscreen, uh, between the canopy bow being right here and those metal uh, braces being right down here, uh, in, right in your field of vision, it was uh it was hard to it was hard to see out of that aircraft uh, as compared to what you're getting now. So, uh, you know, I could we could talk more and more about that, but that kind of gives you the big, uh, the big picture on the uh, on the U two. In fact, I, I won't dive into it much, but the the, the wings are the wings are in the uh, sorry the fuel are in the wings. 
So as you burn fuel, if you get if you get if you're constantly doing left turns, the left wing will begin to get heavy. So now you're landing, and you can always tell when when, when somebody's landing, they got a heavy left wing because they land, and the left wing goes down. They pick the wing up, and the left wing goes down. They pick the wing up, the left wing goes down. They pick the wing up, and and finally you got to realize you know you got to be holding that left to keep wings level rolling on the runway. You have to hold left wing in because you've got 300 pounds more weight on the left wing than you do on the right wing. Well, then you got to balance the fuel out. And it, 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 again, all these little things add up and they really just compound it. And it just makes it a lot of fun to fly when you get good at it. So, so with a 107 foot wingspan, then presumably you can't land with much bank on. You can actually. Um, when you start getting above about probably about 20 knots of wind, uh, which is you know, we the recommended max is 15. We've certainly had folks that have, you know, Alkenberry, a good good example. The the, the the, the runway at Alkenberry is runway three. The air, the airfield's closed now. It's three zero, but the winds in East Anglia, they're right there. Generally, it's a two ten degree wind. It's a ninety degree crosswind. We always had a ninety degree crosswind when we came back. They they couldn't have built it better for a ninety degree for for a, for a ninety degree crosswind. But um, when you come, I know guys have come back and landed with twenty five, even thirty knots uh, in, 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 uh, of crosswind. And when that's happened, they've been in the flare and they've actually had the wingtip scraping on the ground coming coming uh, coming through the flare. Uh, at touchdowns so we, when you start to getting into those varsity maneuvers landing the aircraft there's there's some additional things you want to consider and you're going to probably go off in the weeds so you just land and shut the throttle off there to try to minimize fodding the engine out getting anything sucked into the engine uh, but uh, you have those you know you see the wingtips they kind of come down and the, the wingtips come down and there's a there's a skid plate on the bottom of each wingtip so if you are dragging the wing or when you're on rollout and the wing does come down it just scrapes onto the onto the skid plate. And once the once the skid plate wears down in 10, 15, 20, 30 rides, whatever it is, maintenance just comes in there, they unbolt the skid plate, drop it, and put a new skid plate on there. So it just uh, it's just a replaceable skid plate. But as long as you're not banging the wing or running the wing into a into a cement post, uh, if you put the wing on the on the ground, you're not going to hurt anything. Does it uh is it slick? Does it slow down quickly? Um you have air brakes, right? Oh, uh, we do. In fact, if you if you if you look at the uh, uh, I haven't confirmed this story, but year, years ago, I'm told that when they uh, when they went from the original A U two A the C model, which was about a about eighty uh, about eighty foot wingspan, maybe what uh, fifty feet long, and then then we we grew the plane by about thirty percent. All the planes that fly now are one hundred and four foot wingspan, sixty five feet long. I'm told that when Kelly Johnson came out and they were assembling the first one. He looked out there because they had these tiny little puny speed brakes that clamshells would come out in the back. He apparently walked out and went. Ah, I forgot to increase the size of the speed brakes. Don't know if it's true, but they are pretty pathetic. Um, they, they, they're not aesthetic, but as far as as far as performance, they don't do a whole lot for you. But uh, if you're up at 160 knots or better, yeah, they'll give you they'll give you some they'll give you some uh, some drag. But they're 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 not big massive speed brakes, so they they they, they really don't do much. So yes, the plane is very slick. Um, it's about a 20 if it's clean, about a 22 to one glide ratio. And uh, so if you're at 10,000 feet and you lose the engine, you can go about 37 miles, no wind by the book. So we used to joke over the UK, uh, if we lost the engine at 70,000 feet over the UK, the most difficult choice you had was A, which RF base has the highest per diem and, we were, and where's the officer's club open? So you, you know, you had, you had, you know, back in the 90s, you had a lot of places to pick from. So ah, ah, pick, your, pick your place and go there, you know? So, <laughs> so, so you, you talk about uh, glide ratio. I, I'm, I fly gliders and so glide ratio okay. is a, a, a figure that that I'm, I'm sort of interested in, and that's kind of why I was asking whether or not it slowed down. Because of course, you know, if you fly gliders, a the techniques that you're talking about for landing are familiar, mm-hmm. um, and and b you have uh, spoilers or, or air brakes. Uh, there's a there's an argument in the community as to w- which is the correct term, but at any rate, a handle that you pull and these boards pop up on the wings and they kill your lift. Um, so, so did you find, or or is it true that people who have gliding experience were more comfortable initially with with that sort of challenge of landing the airplane do you fly a similar sort of profile to a glider in landing i.e uh, coming in and committing to the landing nosing down popping the spoilers and then um, sort of power off in the landing how, how, what does it look like i uh well first of all as far as backgrounds i i we found that anybody that had flown more types of aircraft to include gliders especially did better when they came out for the interview process uh, when I ran the interview process for about five years, I would regularly have people call me and go, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about coming out and interviewing. I'm just finishing my first tour. I'm just mid number of hours. You know, what do you recommend? And I would tell them, you get one shot. You get one interview. If you don't do it, you can't go away for three years and reapply. You get one shot. So if you think you're ready and you want to come do it now, do it. But historically, we found that if you, if you go do a second tour in another type of aircraft, for example, go back to the training command 
and go fly the T6. Three years as an instructor flying a you know, tandem aircraft, pretty good performance in the T6. You're learning formation. Uh, you're teaching people. You know, it's a lot of responsibility. You're doing the aerobatics. You're doing the engine out patterns. You do three years of that, not only is it a, is it a, is it a great time uh, and, and a, a great experience, but it'll probably make you more successful at your, U, at your, uh, at your uh, U2 interview. Some people take that advice. Some people don't. Man, that's, it, I'm just, just telling them what it is. Uh, but we found that when they do something like that, they, they tend to have a higher chance of success. When we've seen people come into the program with a great deal of uh, a civilian background, gliders, aerobatic time, tail dragger time, yeah, they've, uh, they've, they've done pretty exceptional in the, uh, in the aircraft. And I'm not, I'm not rated in gliders. When I, when I actually was in the UK, I, I, I joined the uh, RAF Upwood Gliding Club. I don't know if it still exists, but that was my first gliding experience and soloed out with them. Uh, but yeah, we've, uh, the U2 has, uh, has lift spoilers and they're, hydro, they're, they're electrically act activated. You hit those and boom, they pop, both of them pop up on the wing and they're designed to do the same thing, kill the lift on the wing to allow you um, uh, allow it to get down faster. It actually changes, it, it raises the stall speed by the U2 by two knots. When you when you have the list spoilers up, um, so yeah, very. Uh, it's uh, when you when you fly gliders, you've got to be you've got the yaw string. We've got a yaw string, and if you're going to fly it correctly, you're going to be using a lot of rudder inputs. There's not too many aircraft, you two, are, not too many military aircraft where you need to be putting the rudder in to fly it correctly. You, you know, I've gotten a few flights in the F-16. You fly the F-16. You tell it. You tell the computer you need to make a hard right turn. It'll do everything it needs to do to give you the most perfect right turn you you need to do. Same with the C-17. I'm told. But uh, yeah, so to go back to your question, uh, a, lot of, a lot of similarities to flying gliders from what I've seen and whatever your background is, if there's a lot of aviation there, you'll, you'll tend to do better in the U2 uh, with that background. You mentioned earlier um, that part of the interview process, it's, it's two-way and that it's, you know, part of it is for them to understand it's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. Which aspects then of, of being part of the program are not for everybody? Which, you know, what, what, what puts people off? Uh, hard to say. I think, um, some of it may be, um, I had one, we had one, uh, it's not too often where people will quit the interview. We had one pilot that came through and, uh, after the end of his second interview, right, he came to me and he said, I'm going to, uh, let me stop. When we, when they get there, we tell them at any point during this interview, we've given you, we've given you two airline tickets, one to fly here on and one to fly back on. You can take that airline ticket and go back home anytime you want. You're not required to complete the process. You go as far as you want with this. And if you don't like it, please be honest with us and let us know. And we will say, thank you very much. Shake your hand, head on back and, and move on with a great career if you don't like this. And we had a pilot that after two interview rides, he said, you know what? This is, I, don't, I do not ever want to imagine myself in the space suit coming back after nine hours of doing a no flap landing in, turb- in, a, in a hot thermally day. He goes, I, I, he goes, I just... Some people find this fun. I don't. I, I don't. I, I. I. don't like this. It's, I, I don't want to do it. I said. So are you, are you. You know. You ready to call it? He's like, yeah. He goes. I appreciate it, but I, this is not for me. Okay, great. Uh, one guy came out and looked at it, and there he was. I think he was looking for some more career progression and thought that we were too small of a niche community and couldn't get to where he wants to go. But uh, the people that generally quit get a. Uh, it has to do with flying the aircraft. Uh, it has to do with after after. I've had a few folks after one ride go, ah, I'm not too sure about it. And I will tell them, hey, go do the second ride. You're, just see how it goes in the second ride. It's going to be a little more intense, but you may be a little more comfortable. And usually after the second ride, they'll come back and go, you know what? It feels pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty good with it. But occasionally they'll come back after the second ride and go, you know, I don't know about this. And the deal I had when I ran the interview program was the first two rides are free. They're, if you quit after the, second, after the second ride and don't want to do this anymore, that is fine. You can fly back and we're, we're glad you came out. Please tell your friends about it. We'd love to see them. But after the third ride, if we, if you fly the third ride, we come in and we elect to hire you. You, the, 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 we expect you to say yes to the hire because it, it, it's happened a couple of times in the last twenty-five years where we actually took people through three rides and they kind of sandbagged us and they came back and said, "Yeah, thanks, but no thanks." So uh, I made it, I made the expectation very clear. If you just want to, if you wanted to go fly the airplane, do two rides, that's fine. But after the third ride, if 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 you're good enough to go, if we, if you're good enough and you've met our our um, You've met what we need to see, then we expect you to say yes to the ride to, to the offer. That, that ties in with my my next question then around the interview process, which is which is the culture. So, um, you know, you talked about some people 
you know, taking their time off and going and spending it doing whatever they want. Some people hanging around the squadron, you know, sort of soaking up the gouge, whatever, you know, trying mm-hmm. to understand what it's all about. When it came to the, the decision to hire, how much emphasis is placed on the stick and rudder skills and how much on, on cultural fit? Uh, generally, it's the stick and, it's generally the stick and rudder. Can we train them within the constraints of the syllabus? Are we seeing what we want for um, uh, – for somebody who is going to go fly with no wingman and no nobody else on board for you know for 10, 10 11 hours at a single pop, um, and we, you know we're taking a very very small um, sampling size you know of seven hours of flying time. So I'm not saying the process is perfect, but it's it is what it is, and we have to make that decision based on what we see. And some people could have a bad bad couple of days. Uh, generally, if it's not a good if, if if there's other things that are not going to be a good fit, we'll generally see it you know before you know before the end of week one, and we'll address it then. Um, it has happened where some things have come up uh, that were not flying related on the Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, and the and the interview is terminated for de- depending on the situation what it was. But if it gets to the if it gets to the uh, the third flight and the uh, and two instructors are sitting down and going, what do you think? Is this guy doing what he needs to do uh, so that he or she can get hired by the program? It's we're talking about the flying portion. We've already assumed that, that their officership and their fit to the squad is going to be good and. You know, listen, you know, in this day and age, the, the people coming through, I mean, it's very rare to find somebody that has a that has a personality or a, or a bad fit to the program because uh, just the, the level of aviators we're getting applying to the program are very good. And we've we vet them pretty good before they ever show up. I know when I ran the program, I, I was pretty aggressive about calling. Usually if somebody had a couple of assignments, I wouldn't call their current commander. I would call their two, commander two or three ago, who's maybe now at the staff of the Pentagon. He doesn't have any vested interest in the guy. Hey, tell me about such and such, or, or, or you know, what what can you tell me? And I, again, I wouldn't put credence in simple, simple one person's comments, but I would call around and I would track people down that that uh, that knew the particular pilot and uh, try to try to build a picture of uh, of confidence. And um, uh, so I, I thought I thought um, what I do, uh, what I did, and what the current interview uh, guy who maybe runs it now is extremely thorough, also. And most all the guys have been very thorough that, that have run the interview process. Uh, a guy named T Bone is running it right now. He does a he does a fantastic job. Um, but the, when they when they show up there, it's they're, these are, we're getting some really really high quality officers, uh, people, and pilots. I don't. We talked about this before the the interview. I, I don't really want to talk about the spacesuit. You know, there's a thousand interviews about the spacesuit. You people can sure. go and watch that um, somewhere else on 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 YouTube, someone else's channel. Um, but but with regards to claustrophobia, then and um, you mentioned sort of putting someone in the suit and then locking them in a cupboard and saying we're back in half an hour. And I remember mm-hmm. reading, I can't remember whose autobiography it was, but they were talking about the SR program, the SS-71 program. And I'm sure they said that they locked him in in a in a closet or some really tightly confined, you know, something that was, if you're going to get claustrophobic, you know, this would induce it. Um, you know, and he was sort of there for half an hour thinking, well, what's going on? And he thought nothing of it. For me, that sounds like absolutely the worst thing that anyone could right. ever do to me. Um but how how claustrophobic is that experience, and does it take getting used to? Um, even if you don't think you're claustrophobic, if you fly for like you did for twenty odd years, the U two for twenty odd years, are there times where that actually can come up and, and get you, and you, you don't you didn't realize that maybe you had a weakness or? Interesting question. Um, and I'll come. I'll, I'll tell you a story on that in a second here. But I, I don't see that. It's, you know, I'm sure there's been a couple of people and that I'm not aware of that got in the suit and went, whoa, I, I no, not doing this. But I think if you're claustrophobic, my mom was terribly claustrophobic, just hugely claustrophobic. So I, knowing growing up, you know, my mom being claustrophobic, I would think that if you are a claustrophobic person and you can, and you can, you can actually survive getting a mask on your face for the T6, the T30, T30 going through pilot training. Uh, but I think if you're going, I'm going to look at the YouTube program, huh? You gotta wear a spacesuit. You're probably just going to self-eliminate right there. It's probably not even going to be a factor, okay? Because you know your limitations. Uh, I, I never found it to be a problem, but when you get in the suit, you know, you the first time you put the suit on, you're thinking, "Wow, this is this is pretty cool." You know, spaceman spiff. You're not going to space, but you know, you're you're wearing a wearing a spacesuit. It's kind of cool. And then uh, then the reality sits in. Hey, this is this is where I got to learn to work in. And this is this is this is a design to keep me alive. I need to take very good care of it. And I need and I need to work effectively in it and find out the limitations. And that's why we spend some time, you know, with the with the folks flying and you know, go do a five hour over California. Learn how how you work the suit and learn how you stay comfortable in the suit. Learn how you don't overwork yourself, give yourself the bends because of it. Over de, you know dehydrate yourself because the suit it's it's like 
It's like walking around in the summertime wearing a scuba suit. You know, you're going to get hot if you if you don't manage the air conditioning well, or if you're working thrashing around the cockpit, raising your body heat. You're gonna you're gonna get dehydrated. You've got to stay hydrated in that. So, um, uh, we 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 get a, get a fair amount of time in the suit in training. Um, you know, with with all the time I wore the suit, this was probably back in um, I don't know two thousand and three or four. I was already a highly experienced U2 pilot. It was a Beale. I was going up on a training flight and I was sitting, you know, we have, we have, we, they, they, they put you in this lazy boy ch- chair and they put you, they put you in a van, they drive you out to the airplane and you're mobile. The guy driving the chase car, he or she's pre-flight in the cockpit. And you're just kicked back in the chair, you know, in the lazy boy with the air conditioner on, just kind of waiting. And I usually just lay there and just kind of, you know, relax and doze or whatever, you know, while I'm in the van for 15, 20 minutes. And on this particular day, I suddenly had this overwhelming urge slash panic that I had to get out of the suit. I had to open the visor. And I started having this argument with myself, John, what are you doing? You've you've been doing this for 15 years. Just, I got to get out of this. Stop, breathe. And this this probably lasted 60 or 90 seconds. And I just had this, I mean, I was probably getting on the edge of, you know, where I wanted to even, or I was going to probably, you know, hyperventilate. And I, Finally, got, you know, the, the reasonable side of me took over and like, what are you doing? Just calm down. But for about 60 to 90 seconds, I had this incredible feeling of I am claustrophobic. You've got to get me out of here. And that has really helped me appreciate what people that are claustrophobic go through. I've only had it that one, you know, 60 second time. And I've never had it since. Um, but I will tell you that when you do, when you are working the suit, you know, you, you wear it for a couple, two or three years. And, you know, you hate, you know, you really get to the point where you hate putting the suit on. And then you start to get really good. You can twirl a pencil in the suit and you can, you can do, I mean, you can, you can, you know, you can be talking on the radio and be going to the bathroom and drinking at the same time and do everything at the same time. And you're like, I, I'm in total command of the suit. I know, I know it's gone, but it takes you a few years to get there. So you kind of go to the, the suit's cool on the first flight, then two or three years of, I hate the suit. And then you and the suit agree, you shake hands with the suit and the suit and you, you and the suit love each other. Okay. And you, you at least agree to get along through good and bad times. And, uh, and that's kind of the way it goes, I think, throughout the rest of your career. Uh, I've talked to, I, we, I've had one of my good friends over, uh, or I was over at his house like, uh, three nights ago, and we got talking about flying high. And even the comment, he said, I'd love to go back and fly the airplane again, but I am not putting on that suit. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, the suit definitely elicits a lot of different uh, emotions uh, when you ask different pilots about it. What's the longest that you flew um, in the suit for? I flew a 12-1. Uh, 12.1 and 12.0, both of those were ferry flights. Actually, uh, January of 2014, uh, 12.1 flew a ferry to plane from uh, Fairford, RF Fairford in the UK, back to Beale. That was a 12.1. Um, 12.0, another time out of the UK, ferrying a jet. Uh, we've had people, I mean, I think, I think the longest flight ever flown in a U2, let's go back and look. I believe it was in, this, in, in the old R model, which is a, not, a, not a fuel efficient engine. And it was over 14 hours. I don't know how you get over 14 hours in that old in that old J75. And uh, oddly enough, uh, if history serves me right, the pilot was one of the RAF pilots, one of the Brits that was flying the uh, the U2. So um, the UK ha- a UK pilot has the longest flight ever in a U2, if I'm not mistaken, 14 and a half hours, something like that. Crazy amount of time. Is the seat comfortable? The seat is fairly comfortable. It's the same seat that was in the SR71. I'm told it's the same seat they had in the space shuttle uh, for the first four flights in the space shuttle when they had an ejection seat there. Uh, it's uh, it's a proprietary seat. It's a Lockheed seat, uh, really really cushy cushion, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a comfortable seat. When you come, they they made some change to the pressure suit about 15 years ago, actually uh, probably 2003. The old pressure suit had a kind of a built-in. They had this, it just kind of, it just kind of fit to your, you know, to your butt and your seat. And when you sit in there, it just kind of molded around you. It was great. And the Air Force and the company that makes the suit in their infinite wisdom decided to take that to save weight. I, I don't care what the weight is. I'm, I'm sitting, but it's, a, it's, it's significantly less comfortable uh, after 10 hours uh, than it was before then. So that, that was actually one of the change features to modernize the suit that actually made it worse. But when you, when you're in the suit, the old suit, and you combine that with a fairly comfortable seat, yeah, you can, I found I could stay in there forever until they changed over to the new suit. Now it's, now you start to get the straps uh, riding up on you. And when you get out, you'll, you'll have some good strap marks across your behind. You mentioned the U2R and you mentioned the old engine. Um, I'm sort of 
flip-flopping a little bit here, but going back to the landing, what, what, what's the responsiveness like on the engine then? I mean, presumably you're always going to be landing in really long runways, so you, you've, you've got quite a bit of sort of and a margin for error if, if you think uh, you need to land long or, or whatever, but does the engine spool up quickly? Does it, uh, you know, do you have to yeah, really be ahead of it? Yeah, the, Jason, the old Pratt & Whitney engine we had, which was the same engine that was in the F-105, F-106, we got rid of those in the, um, uh, I think the last one of those flew around 1996 or seven before we went to the, the, the current engine, the GE engine. It's, it's basically the same engine that's in a B-2 bomber. Uh, pretty good response time. It was a turbojet. The current engine, when you, if, you're, if, if the engine is in idle and you are stabilizing idle and you, you push it forward, it's eight to 10 seconds to really, really good thrust. It's, it takes a while. So if you're going to hedge your bet on landing on a big crosswind, you, know, you, you may have cracked the power back, but once you pull it to idle, if you, if you think you're going to need thrust, you're, you, you know, it's, it's, like on a, it's like on a battleship in the movie. I request flank speed. I sir, flank speed. Okay, and then okay, flank speed. Here we go. And then you know, after it gets to the engine room, then they, then you finally got the power coming back up. So, uh, uh, but the, the so the J seventy five definitely had a faster response. Uh, I had a landing at Al. I'll give you an idea. A pretty good response. Had it been had we had the the current engine when I was a new guy at Alconbury, I would have probably crashed an airplane. And had I survived, I probably wouldn't wouldn't have been allowed back in the program. Uh, came into, uh, I how many hours I had, I probably had 250 hours in the U2 at the time. And we were landing on runway uh, one, two at Alconbury and the winds were, uh, uh, winds were coming out of the, uh, out of the left. And I'm coming in doing my landings where I had an instructor, you know, in the chase car, pretty new guy, but you know, winds are you know, they're 10, 12 knots, which for us at Alconbury was like, you know, it was a walk in the park. And uh, just came up, did a few landings, came back. I did my no flap landings. I'm coming in and our no flap, and we fly in. They're very, very shallow, about a degree and a half. And you're coming in it, and coming down final. And as I, as I pulled the power back to idle, everything's going well. I go into the flare, go into the flare, go into the flare. And all of a sudden, whack. I mean, just at two feet, the plane just went hard left, whack, just yawed to the left. And I immediately just went, Ugh! stuffed the power up as the plane came down. The mobile in the chase car is going, throttle off, throttle off, throttle off. He was, he was committed to me just riding out through the weeds because the plane had yawed off so much. So I'm heading for the, I'm heading for the you know, across the runway. I think the Alcambay runway was 200 feet wide, so I'm right on the center line. So I'm angling off towards the dirt. And I, power's come on in. I'm engine spooling back up. And as I see the you know, engine's kind of starting to come on up, and right as I get to the edge of the runway, the grass kind of, you know, the edge of the runway is kind of going underneath the nose. I, I pulse the yoke and lift off, and the plane does one of these, and I just, I cleared the, uh, the shack there for the, uh, for the, for the barrier, the barrier housing that, where they do all the maintenance there. So clear the, clear the grass, clear the shack and, you know, up and up and around up to the downwind, you know, and, you know, in my Alconberry Tower, Alconberry Tower uh, request, you know, uh, try to get myself under control. It was, it was really, really close. So, uh, Came back down. Uh, let's make the next one a full stuff. You got it. So came back in, normal landing, and landed with the full, flaps full down. Obviously, normal landing. Came in into the squadron. Qu- squadron commander was up in the tower. I saw it. He came in. He goes, "What happened to you, uh, sir?" I, I I let it get away from me. Okay. Uh, so the next day, well, uh, one of the senior instructors, who was a real high time guy, went out. Normally one two, ideal uh, or the exact same wind conditions. He took off and flew his low, did a couple landings, came in to runway one, two on a no flap, two feet, two feet, two feet, right, he's going to the stall, whack, <laughs> throttle up, <laughs> clears the rut, clears the grass, clears the barrier housing, throttle, I mean, they're yelling throttle off, throttle off. The exact same scenario happened to him. So they went something, okay, we can believe it if Huggins did it because he's a knucklehead and he doesn't have any hours, but for Ken to do it, something's going on in two days in a row, same condition. So they grounded the plane. And Maine just went and did a bunch of uh, looking at it. And sure enough, the flaps were completely misrigged. And the, the left wing was stalling dramatically early as compared to the right wing. So when you're getting down to the flare, that left wing stalls creates a huge amount of induced drag. And uh, not only does the, does the left wing drop, but it, that drag pulled the plane into a left yaw heading us for the weeds. So I'm convinced had I crashed the airplane and, you know, they, they just would have had a a destroyed airplane would have figured it was a new guy who let the plane get away from him there. But fortunately they went out there and um, analyzed the aircraft and said, yeah, it's completely out of rig. Big, big, uh, big problems there. So got that fixed and, you know, obviously we moved on, but. 
what are the, what are the difference in the numbers then landing speed wise between flat and and flapless landing? Uh, uh, with the flaps, uh, it's, it's, we use a base speed of 70 and then uh, you add more fuel. But the difference between the flap and a no flap is five knots of indicated airspeed. Um, so you, so you land at 70 knots? That's, well, that's, you're actually landing in the 60s, but your final approach speed. So if you're coming back from an operational sortie, uh, you'll have a, you have 70 knots. And then we, you, because of all the equipment we carry on the jet, you'll generally have about four more knots you need to add to the aircraft because of the extra weight. So 74. And then if you have 500 gallons, let's say you have 400 gallons of fuel on board, that's going to be an additional four knots. So your final, your, your, your speed at which you want to hit 10 feet is about 78 knots. So you'll come out, hit, you know, hit it, uh, power to idle, you know, at 78 to 10 feet, power comes to idle, flare it out, flare it out, flare it out, and you'll probably touch down in the high 60s. Wow. And then again, for no flap, add five knots to that. And we also have a, a flap position called gust up, where it's uh, as a glider guy, reflex. So we'll, the, the flaps and the ailerons will actually shift up six, seven degrees, and uh, it allows you to unload the tail. It's better for turbulence. You can go faster with the aircraft. It's, it's actually a brilliant design uh, that I use all the time. I, I fly everywhere gust up on the aircraft, but that adds an additional five knots uh, on top of the no flap. So 10 knots above a normal landing uh, if you're landing with the gust up. Just before we leave uh, your, the discussion on, on the landing then, um, the one thing that we haven't really sort of referenced to anybody i mean i'd imagine most people are familiar with it but it and you've already talked about it being a motorbike with a 104 foot wingspan but it doesn't have uh, and you've talked about the skids uh, at the end of the wingtip but there is no wheel at the end of the wingtip when you land is there so the wheels fall right. off when you take off so, yeah they look yeah they look like leaf springs off of a pickup truck and they they sit about mid yeah a little yeah a little more than uh, midway out on the wing but you'll see them in the pictures out there just a just a big metal leaf spring weighs I don't know, 30, 40 pounds with the little wheels on there. And they're, they're just for ground handling on the aircraft. Maintenance will go out and unpin, the, unpin them for takeoff. And as you roll, as the, as the, you know, the, wings, the wings like this, as it gets lift, the wing will lift up and just lift right out of the, right out of the pogo, we call them pogos, the outrigger wheels. They'll just tumble down the, dry, uh, down the, uh, the runway. And, and like you said, when you come back and land, you don't have those. And you're, uh, you're landing a motorcycle with a 104-foot wingspan. So, so do you have to, uh, you know, if you allow one wing to drop, having established that you can actually skid it, you know, run, run a wing along the ground during, during the landing, and that's, that's okay. Um, is, there, is there the possibility of ground looping if one wing, wing sort of digs in? Are you supposed to try and keep them level until you stop? And You can ground loop, but it's not because the wingtip is digging in. It's, just, it's generally because of the fact you've got a significant crosswind and it's, it's, everything's compounding and, and, and you're not making the corrections enough. And finally, the, the center of gravity gets out too far before and you're not going you're not going to be able to change the uh you're not going to be able to change that momentum shift as it slides out like with any like with any tail dragger type aircraft but um we'll see a right you know when we fly the interview flights uh we fly them in fairly benign conditions we're not going to make these people that have no experience in aircraft go out and fly in 10 12 knots of crosswind so they're pretty benign conditions when, when we're flying them and their first usually for the first three or four landings when they're going on the runway the wings are just they're, they're, they're just bouncing off the runway because as a, you know, even, you know, for any, it doesn't, I don't care what you fly. When you land the, the wing, the, the left and right wings are taken care of because you have tricycle landing gear. You've got to, you know, the, the wings stay level and you don't calibrate your brain and eyes to, you know, one or two degrees of bank. So they'll be going down the runway and, and uh, you'll hear the mobile go, raise your left, raise your left. And, and I'm in the backseat going, Hey, look at your left wing. Oh, you know, you're scraping, they're, they're you know, running out scraping the left wing. They think the wing's level. And they look and they, they lift the wing up there. I'm like, okay, that's le- that's wings level right there. And then, you know, the next thing you know, it's like raise your right. You're scraping, you're scraping your right wing, you know. And but after three or four landings, it's amazing the brain and you know, they 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 pick it up. And then after three, four, five landings, they're generally not dragging the wing. It may not be perfect, but they're they've generally got the wing off the ground. But on the two seaters, I think maintenance changes those those skids on a much more frequent basis than we do on the other ones. Is that so? so- so just to round up then the interview process um, f- from your point of view, so you stayed the extra time, you, you got hired. Was your wife still um, at Bill with you when, when you, know, you, you went on that final ride and, and, uh, and you got the, the good news? Yeah, she, yeah, she came up for the weekend and uh, yes, she was. So that, uh, that Tuesday after Memorial Day, you know, I said, okay, honey, um, I'll let you know in a few hours. And, uh, you know, uh, came back and, uh, you know, after, after I was accepted, let her know the good news. So, and we were pretty excited because, you know, we really, we both really were hoping to go to England 
And uh, when I was hired, they gave me the option. They said, hey, you want to you want to stay at Beale and fly the T-38? Or do you want to want to go, in, go go live in England? And no, no T-38s over there, but obviously a, um, a different experience. So we, uh, we, 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 took the, we took the England assignment, obviously. That was what we both wanted to go do. And as, as, a, as, a, as a follow-on to that, that was May. I came back to Beale in August, I believe. So we went back to Texas, packed up all our stuff. We shipped it off to the UK. We came to Beale for six months of training. And I'd been in training a few weeks. And uh, the squadron commander, Colonel Bruce Kugel, just a great American, uh, calls me in the office and I get attention. Huggins, uh, looks like you're going to be staying at Beale. We're going to be closing Alkenberry now. We don't need any new guys there. So congratulations. You're going to stay here in the ninth reconnaissance wing. Yes, sir. Walked out and uh, went back. And, you know, we, I was disappointed. I told my wife and she was terribly disappointed. She was just, she really wanted to go to the UK and did not want to stay at Beale there. And then um, the that was on a Thursday or Friday, the following Monday. Go see Colonel Kugel. He'll come in at attention. Huggins, I got new news for you. All of your stuff's been shipped to England. The, mon- the money's been sunk. You're going to Alkenberry. So they didn't want to wait for my stuff to get to England and then turn around and ship it all the way back. So they said, what? Just send him to England. So I ended up, I ended up going to Alkenberry. I was the last person. This is uh, I ended up getting to England March 12th of 1990. I was the last person to go to uh, Alkenberry directly out of training. During my time in England, they had a couple of U2 pilots that did backfill, but they were all experienced guys that, that had been former U2 pilots at Beale. But as far as the last guy to go as a new student graduating from training to Alkenberry, I was the, I was the last one, which meant that for my entire three and a half years there, I was the bar officer. So uh, I, had to, I, had to, I had to take care of that. But, you know, most guys have to do it for three, three, six months. I had it for three and a half years. I was a crock. So as somebody who lives in, in the UK, I would say I would go Northern California every time. Um, yeah. so, but what was the allure then for, for you and your wife and, with the UK assignment? Oh, she wanted to live in the, you know, she wanted to live in the UK. I wanted to go live in the UK. I mean, you know, tr- join the military, travel the world. I knew if I stayed in the U2, I'd, be, I'd eventually get to come do time in California. But um, there was a big part of me that wanted to stay at Beale because coming out of the training command with, 3, 000, or with 1,000 hours in the T-38, I would have instantly been an instructor at Beale flying the T-38, and um, that would have been a great deal. But the Beale pilots at the time were gone 180, 200 days a year, and I'm, you know, I've been married a year. And uh, we, were, my, my, we were both like, hey, you know, do we, do we want to take that much you know, time away from each other this early on? And going to Alkenberry, where all the missions were flown out of Alkenberry, was very little, very little time. I mean, we worked hard, but we were not gone generally for 180, 200 days a year. Um, it was, it was, it was great for family life and that was what we wanted to go do. And, uh, and like I said, you know, she had lived in, uh, she had lived in Greece. Her dad was military. She traveled all over the world, lived in Ch- Japan or, uh, uh, Okinawa, Greece, uh, Hawaii, all over the U S. So she was, she was wanted to go, go do the, do the UK thing and, and actually have me home for three years. Cause we knew again, go back to Beale. I'll be on the road uh, at some point. 